but for years and years and years I've invested money or saved money without actually worrying about an emergency fund. And I've started in recent years thinking that this emergency fund is, is the thing that really takes away the stress. It's that, that money that's just there for no reason other than just in case. Welcome to the Teacher Money Show, the podcast dedicated to helping teachers navigate your unique financial challenges and unlock your financial superpowers. I'm your host, Sean Morgan, a full-time teacher. That's right, I teach every day just like you, and personal financial coach. And I'm here to help every teacher, whether you are a seasoned teacher looking for fresh insights or a new educator navigating your first paycheck, have a richer wallet, classroom, and life. The contents of this podcast are informational in nature and are not legal or tax advice. And neither I nor my guests are engaged in the provision of legal, tax, or any other advice. You should not act upon this information without first seeking appropriate advice from an accountant, financial planner, lawyer, or other professional. I'm super excited to have Mark on the show today. Mark is a 55-year-old Australian economics and business studies teacher currently working at an international school in Bangkok. Uh, he's working worked in international schools across Asia for the past 23 years and leads a young investors club at a school. And he's recently started a couple of blogs, uh, one of them called The Finance Teacher. That's how I connected with, with Mark. And uh, it's mainly aimed at teenagers, just trying to pass on the financial wisdom to the next generation. He's also created a short ebook called The Teenage Guide to Getting Rich and is working on creating a personal finance course for teenagers. Mark, welcome to the show. Hi there, Sean. Thanks for, very much for having me. I'm uh, very excited to actually have a chat with you. So this is really cool. Yeah, I can't wait. And, and the way that I, I found Mark, I, I just like to dig through financial content specifically for teachers. I, I found uh, Mark while I was doing that. And I, I stumbled across a, a blog post where uh, he talked about what being wealthy really means. So I want to just dive into this. What does wealth mean? And I want you to define it for us. What do you think wealth means, Mark? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, for me, wealth isn't about the um, the cars, about the, the big houses, about the ext extravagant lifestyle. Um, it's more about the freedom, obviously, that you can get from from being wealthy. And I think the, um, the thing that really resonated with me, I saw an interview recently with um, Morgan Housel, who wrote The Psychology of Money, one of my favorite books. And he defined wealth and being rich as being very different. He talked about people who are rich have high incomes, they live the luxurious lifestyle, they spend a lot of money. And he said, well, for him, wealth actually is not how much money you spend, it's actually the money that you don't spend. So it's the money that you keep, it's that money that's you know somewhere in your, in your emergency fund, it's invested, it's in your bank, and it's the money that actually you have there when, when things go bad, you know, when, when you actually need something to sort of uh, get you through or when um, you're obviously preparing for the future, getting ready for retirement. So it's that money that you actually haven't spent. Um, it's the money that you keep. And so for me, that's the, the connection between wealth and freedom, but also this idea of being stress-free and having that sort of um, that money that's just there, knowing that you can handle any challenge. Something happens, you've got it sorted. So for me, that's wealth. It's, it's that freedom, but it's that stress-free life, not worrying about money, I guess. So... You're saying that the more money that you're able to hold on to, that it enables you to uh, reduce the stress that you have in your life, which makes you yeah. wealthier. Yeah, absolutely. I I think this um, you know the whole the whole idea of the you know things like the five move the five movement and, and talking about financial freedom. The freedom is you know the the freedom to choose how much you work if if you're lucky enough to be in that situation. But also, I think it's that freedom to just not have those stresses. I mean, we all have different situations. We have families to look after. We have mortgages to pay. But a lot of the time, um, our life is just better if we don't have to think about money, I suppose. So if we can find ways to um, not worry about money, you know, constantly. And I think that's been my biggest challenge throughout my life is constantly being worried about money and trying to find ways where I can set up systems and things in place where actually I'm not stressed about money. Um, and so I think that's, for me, the definition of wealth, someone who actually doesn't worry about money. And therefore, it doesn't matter how much you've actually got. It's more about, you know, whether you're content with, with that amount and that allows you to live that sort of happy, free and stress-free life. Yeah, that, that's really, that's really great. You know, I, I really like how you're talking about having that money to, to reduce your stress, especially like as a teacher, because 
we we have so many demands put on us as teachers yeah. and it, and it feels like there's a new one every other week saying you need to do this now you need to do that but if if you have the money where you are able to uh support yourself if you didn't have your job at least temporarily if you have that 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 money to fall back on you're able to say no yeah because absolutely. You, you're not worried about keeping your job you can say look i'm not doing that i i i think that's too much i want to focus on you know the most important things and you don't feel that pressure to just just say yes to everything that gets asked of you because you have that uh, that that stress release behind you of having the the finance behind you to back you up so uh, i feel like having well having having the money accumulated to uh to reduce that stress actually will allow teachers to stay in the classroom longer because most people that talk about financial independence talk about leaving your job but i don't want teachers to leave their job necessarily but i, I feel like if you have that the, the finances backing you you can reduce the stress that you have at your job uh, considerably by saying no absolutely yeah i think that's um that's the big thing in in, in teaching, we often feel that we, we're not making enough income in order to kind of live the life we want. So we get tempted by promotions. We get dragged out of the classroom. Um, I was in an admin position for a while and, and I absolutely hated it. I wanted to get back to the classroom. So why did I take the admin position? Well, I took it because it was extra money. Um, and that sort of happens quite a lot. But to be actually able to firstly stay in the classroom, um, to be comfortable with your situation, uh, but also to have that option of maybe taking a, a bit of time off, having a gap year. I mean, I'm, I'm planning on a sabbatical in the next couple of years, which is just so exciting to look forward to. And I know other teachers in my position who have just said, look, I'm going to take a year off. And that's a, that's a luxury that most people don't have to take a year off, knowing that you've either got a job to come back to. And sometimes teachers do have that security, uh, which is, which is great. Um, but they can't afford to take that year off necessarily. So yeah, that's, that's the freedom that, you can create, um, but it, it takes a bit of discipline and it takes a bit of time to get to that situation. Yeah, I think that that's that's fantastic. And congratulations on your ability to take a sabbatical in the, in the near future. That's that's fantastic. Uh, I know that there's, there are many teachers that envy you in that position. Uh, so, like, if someone goes to a traditional, you know, financial advisor, they aren't going to necessarily talk about this stress-free life. This this emotional and mental component of wealth. Uh, how should you think about your finances when you are working towards this, this stress-free wealth instead of the, the traditional wealth uh, metrics? Yeah, I guess the thing with sort of financial advice is it focuses on numbers um, largely. It focuses on where you should invest your money. Uh, it focuses on getting the best return. Uh, it's, it's traditionally been a a numbers game, a financial analysis and, and, you know, that kind of thing. And there's been less focus on, I guess, that relationship with money. Um, and I think if you can fix your relationship with money, uh, that's where you start finding a, a, a better way to live and, and you, you stop thinking about it so much, I suppose. I think with, um, I started looking into this minimalist movement and, and the fire thing and how people were really thinking about do you really need to spend money on certain things? And it, it got me thinking about whether we actually do get satisfaction from the typical spending that we have. Um, and if you can sort of change your relationship with money and find ways to enjoy your life without being extravagant, without being frugal and overly frugal, then you realize that there's a whole lot of things we can do that don't cost a lot of money. And therefore, you know, the opportunity cost is there that you can actually put that money into something else. And, and, and that's the thing that sort of takes away the, the stress a little bit. Um, I've con for, for years and years and years, I've invested money or saved money without actually worrying about an emergency fund. And I've started in recent years thinking that this emergency fund is, is the thing that really takes away the stress. It's that, that money that's just there for no reason other than just in case. You know, so um, I, I think that's the thing that, that people forget. They just think invest, invest, invest. Meanwhile, they've still got debts. They've got credit card debts, which are constantly putting stresses on your finances, taking away your ability to save. Um, and then an emergency arises and they take their money out of their investments and, and give up something that's earning because they haven't sort of prepared. So I think um, it takes discipline, a lot of 
developing of good habits. And, and I think, you know, kids need to be taught these good habits at a, at a, a young age. And starting early, I think, you know, so many of us have this, these regrets of if only we started this when we we're 20, when we we're 30. And, and, and sort of that is a, a, a big learning that I've picked up and I've tried to pass on to my, my daughters as well. So they've become very frugal, but still very happy and, and knowing that they're putting money into the right places and just thinking about their spending, I suppose, which we don't do when we're young. Amen to that. Don't think about spending when you're young. It's, it's a big problem. Uh, I really like your your emphasis on the emergency fund. So I, I'm actually in a, and I, I've, I've talked about this openly in my podcast. I'm in a spot right now where I, I was investing, investing, investing into real estate. I, I'm in a real estate project that's just wrecking me. Um, so mm -hmm. I, it's almost done. When it's finally finished, I will break down the whole terrible mess to, to my listeners. Um, and, you know, I, I had an emergency fund in place. I had, you know, things in place and it just, it destroyed them. Um, but yeah, I, I just wish ask myself, why didn't I have more? You know, why didn't I have a, a larger emergency fund? So it's, it feels like when you're putting all that money in, in, in when you're you know, just going into the emergency fund, just sitting there, like, I, I could do something else with this. But I can tell you from firsthand experience, just put it there, leave it there, right? It, it, it's so much better Absolutely. to leave that money there instead of, uh, you know, trying to pull away from emergency fund uh, to, to invest. You know, even if you have a small emergency fund, big things can happen that can just completely, you know, wipe that away uh, very quickly. Uh, so just making sure that you, you put that money there, you let it grow, you get it big enough before you do any, you know, riskier investment or anything like that. It, it's it's hugely important uh, because yeah. when, you know, the, those large expenses come in, uh, it, it's really stressful, right? It, it really is, is super stressful. So um, just throwing that out there, everyone, that I'm experiencing firsthand. Luckily, I have the financial understanding to, uh, you know, work my way through this, but uh, an emergency fund, a, a much larger emergency fund would have made it much easier than having to do my, my, my financial acumen to make it through this, uh, this For poor sure. investment. So um, it's, it's the boring, it's the boring stuff that makes the biggest difference sometimes. And that's what people uh, I'd like to hear. It is indeed. So do the boring stuff. That's, that's the, uh, the takeaway Do the boring stuff and make sure that you're doing it well. Uh, so, I mean, I just talked about one of them investing yep. before your, your financial, uh, your, your emergency fund is big enough. Are there any other mistakes that people tend to make that's going to increase their stress rather than alleviate it? Yeah, I, I guess you've touched on it with with that uh, concept of the emergency fund, which um, people often ignore. So that's that's a big mistake. Um, and the credit cards, of course. Um, I, I was a, a sucker with credit cards when I was young. Uh, I always tell stories to my um, my students, and they just laugh and laugh and laugh at this story, and it keeps coming back to me all the time. That I, I once bought a car with a credit card, just the most ridiculous thing in the world. You know, cash advance credit card when I was at college uh, to buy a car because I was. I was stupid, but, um, and then explaining to the kids how long it took to pay that money back because you're paying the minimum amount thinking, yeah, I'll just pay that. That's no problem. I can handle it. And it just takes years and years and years. And that debt just doesn't go down. So credit cards, um, are, are a big one uh, and, and not getting rid of that debt. I mean, I, I don't use credit cards at all these days. Um, and very rarely do I need a credit card. Occasionally I'll check into a hotel and they'll say you can't use a debit card, which I think is pretty silly. But um, I think that's the big one. Overusing credit cards, not prioritizing the emergency fund and, and also just buying too much house, you know, just buying that house that's just a little bit beyond what the, the budget can handle because you don't know what's coming around the corner. And it, to be, I, I would hate to have ever been stuck in a situation where um, I'd lost a job and had a mortgage. So I think they're the common things. It's, it's still, unfortunately, this idea of keeping up with the Joneses with, you know, um, I think you've, you're going to touch on it later, lifestyle creep and trying to avoid that, I think, is uh, really important. Yeah, um, I, I just, those, those are all really great. And I think just the, the key takeaway there is, you know, no matter what it is, whether it's getting too much of a house or it's this, you know, overspending on credit cards. It's these things that later are going to continue to take money away from you, right? Having too big of a house that's just taking way too much money out of your paycheck. Having a bunch of stuff on credit cards that's just, you know, minimum payments that are coming out, and it's just taking more and more chunks away from your 
uh, you know, your, your total take home pay because, you know, everyone needs their piece before you get anything. You know, that's, that's the real problem with the, the buy now pay later type of, of systems. A lot of them, <laughs> yep. you know, don't charge you interest, but I mean, like when you think, Oh, I can buy so much more because of that, you soon you get in a trap where you're, you're stuck and you can't really uh, move forward. So yes, just exactly. really, really aware of what's this going to do to my financial situation later. Uh, yeah when you're not making those, those decisions for sure. Um, we, we have a problem as teachers of having a limited income, rising costs, oftentimes our, our, our uh, wage increases are not keeping up with the rising costs, especially as you know, insurance costs are, are skyrocketing. Uh, what can teachers do to, to really try and build some, some tangible wealth, some tangible stress reducing wealth given those constraints? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. And I guess part of the reason that I decided to, um, to leave Australia where I was working was because I, I saw the opportunity overseas for increased incomes. And so working in international schools, I, I heard the, the stories of you know, better packages uh, being looked after a little bit better, um, a lot of financial benefits as well as the lifestyle of, of living overseas and being able to sort of change countries whenever you feel like it. So I've gotten really lucky in sort of making that decision. Um, and I, I see a lot of teachers that I work with that they really have their finances sorted. They're um, teaching couples, for example. So I think, I don't know if that's a hack, if that's a secret to, to marry another teacher, um, having two incomes, but then you've got common holidays as well. Um, and... The other thing about teachers, and this is, again, everyone's in a different situation, right? But um, we do have some freedom. We do have some um, advantages with um, having holidays where we could actually put some time into doing some productive things. And that's really, really hard because we know that's our, our downtime. That's our, our time to kind of recover for the, from the year and, and get ready for the next year. And it's, it's really underestimated as to how important our holidays are for us to recover and get ready. Um, but when you've been teaching for a while and you have your systems in place, maybe you're, you're teaching the same subject that you've taught for quite a while, um, and you can start find, finding ways to uh, become, I guess, more efficient and, and using your time a little better, and then maybe those holidays can be used for other side hustles or finding other projects. I mean, you're, you're working through the night at the moment, so you're finding ways to, to do extra things, and, and teachers are pretty innovative in how they use their time. Um, I remember <clears throat> once when I was a, a kid at school, I, I got my pizza, pizza was delivered by a teacher who I was, uh, was teaching me science. And so I think teachers are very um, sort of aware of the limitations of our, our income and, and if they have the energy and the ability, I suppose, to find other sources of income. I guess that's the, that's the thing, other, other streams of income, which is difficult, it's challenging. So I'm in a situation where I'm a little bit luckier. I feel that uh, financially I'm better off than I was when I was back home. And that it's a little bit of sort of um, geographic arbitrage as well, living in a place where it's cheaper. And I, I think, again, when I was in Australia, I realised that if I was living in the city, I was so much worse off than my teacher friends who I went to college with who were living out in the country where cost of living was just so much cheaper. So I don't know if... If that's any help at all, because most of us don't want to pack up and leave where we live. Um, but finding ways to cut our costs, uh, sometimes sometimes making a move can actually make a big difference. Um, moving to a cheaper part of town or, um, as I did, leave, leaving, leaving the country. But um, everyone's in a different situation and we're in, in on different incomes depending upon where we are. But I guess the ability to be able to use our holiday time to be productive, not necessarily to bring in great amounts of income for now, but maybe down the track, it will, it will become something and we can do something else that can bring in some ex extra revenue streams. Um, so that was a very long winded answer. I'm sorry about that, but um, that's sort of the, the things that I was thinking of, but maybe my situation is, is a little different to most. No, you know, I, I agree with, with so much what you're saying, you know, like you having a side hustle of some kind, you know, during your break, I think that's huge. We, we talk about like we need you know, the break from the students, but I think that if you are doing something that's significantly different from what you're doing with students, 
you're still getting a break, even though you're working, because you don't have to, you know, sit on a beach all day for two months to recuperate from teaching. Uh, yeah, exactly. If you do, then you need to change something about the way that you're teaching. Probably you need to to you know work on on how it is when you're when you're in the classroom because if you just change what your brain and, and the stresses that your brain are handling, even your brain does better when you're, they're just in a something in a new environment. Um, so yeah, I think that working on something that's just not the same stress as teaching over those, yeah. those breaks is, is is huge, and that can you know be very beneficial income wise. And I, I, I cannot stress enough the importance of choosing a, a, a good location for teaching. I mean, like I was living in Colorado and they are some of the lowest paid teachers and one of the most expensive places, at least in the area that I was willing to live. So I mean, like I, I was I was choosing the lowest salary and the highest cost of living is like, oh, this yeah. just, this doesn't work. I, I can't make the numbers work in that way. So I, I moved to a place that very few people want to live and it is not as gorgeous as Colorado is, but it's so much cheaper, I'm getting paid much better. So even, you know, within the United States or within your, your city, like you were saying, you can, you can do some uh, geo arbitrage. Uh, you don't have to live in the, the swankiest part of town. You don't have to be close to, to your school necessarily. If your school is in a super high cost of living area, commuting might be better for your long-term financial position. If yeah, you know, 30 minutes away, it is, ridiculously cheaper to you know rent or to buy so just being uh, aware of how much it's costing you to uh to live where you're living could you live somewhere else whether far or near uh just reducing those expenses as much as possible while increasing the income whether as a side hustle or even you know getting the additional education or things like that you need to to get more money while you're teaching uh those are all things that we need to consider just as much as we can do to increase that gap between our our salary and our expenses will be where we can can invest in and move forward from there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of the biggest reasons people can't build that gap is because they don't keep their expenses low. As you mentioned, we have this lifestyle creep uh, or lifestyle inflation inflation that comes in. That as you make more money, you just spend more money and you never feel like you're making more money because you're always spending what you have. Uh, how can teachers avoid falling into the trap of spending more than they earn uh, and which, you know, obviously is going to increase their, their stress. Yeah. I, I guess that's, that's a tough one because we can all think back to when we lived on a, a lower income. And in many cases we were quite happy. Uh, I think in my college days when I was struggling, I had, had nothing. Um, and you know, we would, we would be looking out for all these ways to save money, whether it was, you know, all you could eat Pizza Hut deals on a Thursday night with our college buddies and things like that. Um, but when I look back, it was it was a, a good lifestyle. And then suddenly you get your income and you think, okay, what can I do now? So it's it's really hard to not want a better life. And we always associate um, a better life with spending more money because we just think that well, that's how you get the better life. You spend more money. You you buy a, a better car. You buy some some nice toys. You um, take an extra holiday, you eat out at restaurants a little bit more often. I, th I think when I was younger, it was, you know, one night out for, for dinner and a drink was was a luxury. And then all of a sudden you're going out more often, you drink, you're eating at uh, more expensive restaurants. You want to move to a nicer house and a nicer part of town because that's what your friends have done. And so I, I think that the tough thing really is that we are still we're still comparing ourselves to everyone else in terms of our, our lifestyle, our quality of life. Um, in Australia, I guess it's the same as in the US, that the car is an important thing. You want the nicest car. You want a new car. Um, you want, whether, whether you're young or old, the, the car is a big, a big expense. And if you're borrowing money to buy a car, then as you said before, that's eating into your potential to, to save and to invest. And so how do we avoid that? It's got to be a complete mindset change, I think. That's what I was talking about before when I said, well, what things can we find that actually are just as enjoyable, just as satisfying that actually don't cost that much money? So for me, uh, a picnic in the park now that I'm older wasn't always the case, but a picnic in the park with my wife is completely as satisfying as a five-star hotel lunch sort of thing. Uh, my wife loves five-star hotels, by the way, so we do occasionally get dragged to those those uh, those places, but I'm often sitting there thinking, 
I spent a couple hundred dollars, but I'd rather be just sitting on a beach. So finding things that actually um, uh, don't cost very much and not comparing ourselves to anyone else. Uh, I, I think the key thing today is that there's such a, you know, there were such lifestyle gaps, aren't there? And, we, and we're constantly bombarded with how other people's lives look. And what we need to also think about sometimes is that the people that look like they're, they're wealthy or, or look like they've, they're doing really well, um, we, we don't know what their situation is. We don't know what their credit card balance is. We don't know how financially solid they really are. They just look like they're wealthy and we think, well, that's what we, we need. And um, Hence, a whole heap of financial education should be about how we think about money and, and, and what we um, how we can get it just change our focus and change our emphasis on spending money, I guess. So we, we, we mentioned the psychology of money as, as a book someone could read to help with that potentially. Do you have any other resources or any other books that maybe that you, you really enjoyed that helped you with your uh, mindset? Yeah, so that, that one was a great one. Um, I listen to it occasionally still, um, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Um, I actually read a book by a guy called Andrew Hallam. It's called uh, Millionaire Teacher, and he was an international teacher as well. And so he sort of sort of started me on this whole idea of how a teacher can become wealthy through investing and really boring index fund investing over a long, long period of time. Um, so that was one book that I really liked. But I mean, the, the thing is that um, like I, I read a lot of personal finance books and I listen to a lot of uh, podcasts. And they're all pretty much the same. It's all the same kind of advice. And people might say, oh, well, that's, what does that tell you? What it tells me is that that must be the right advice. If they're all saying the same thing, and if it all sounds pretty boring, why aren't we doing it? Um, so you can go all the way back to the first time when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I, was a, when I was a kid. And there were a lot of little things in there that I just hadn't thought of. Buy assets, uh, create some income instead of... Um, instead of having the, the money leaving my account, have ways to uh, buy assets that can actually generate income. Um, and there are, there are so many financial advisors out there. The ones that I, I um, sorry, financial advice and financial books. So I, I read a lot that are Australian um, because there's an Australian focus in, in what I'm looking at. There was one called The Barefoot Investor, which was just amazing in terms of um, being a really popular one for Australians. But um, I think there are so many out there. I loved, and some of them are old as well. Um, I love um, the, it's called The Richest Man in Babylon. I don't know if you've read that one. It's a great story. I mean, if you can sort of get over the language that they use in it. Um, but it's, it's just simple life lessons. Um, and the, the Millionaire Next Door, another one as well, which sort of, it, it tells us that when you go looking for millionaires, the millionaires are often living in the suburbs, living average lives um, and not looking like they're, they're wealthy. You know, they're dress, dressing just like the rest of us. They're, wearing, they're, they're driving a secondhand car, but they've got all these investments and they've got these, um, you know, these properties that they've invested in. Um, so there are, there's a lot of advice out there, but a lot of it is pretty much the same thing. Um, spend less than you earn. Um, save and invest the difference, uh, pay yourself first. All of these simple little things that we, we hear and we read about in these books, um, we're kind of hearing the same things, but it's hard to actually do it rather than just um, just read about it. Yeah, I mean, that that's, that's fantastic. I love that list. I've heard of most of those books before. So, I mean, obviously they're, they're tried and true. They're books that you know, people have, have read and, and enjoy and give the same boring Correct advice. I, I love exactly. it. Exactly. Yep. Uh, so when you've read these books, they've taught you how to do these things. What's maybe just one habit or routine that you have picked up from these books or just from your own personal experience that you think is essential to someone starting to build a more wealthy, wealthy life? Yeah, I think... Um... You always hear about budgeting, okay? And so, so budgeting is pretty important. It's important to do some tracking of your expenses and to know where your money is going. And I think that's um, that's great, but I think that's sort of only a part of it. And for me, budgeting didn't really work. Like I tried the, the envelope system where you put your cash in envelopes and you take money out of the envelope for certain purchases. And then every month I'd be taking money out of my 
savings envelope and my investment envelope to pay for food because I'd spent too much for my food envelope. So, so once I started changing my priorities and paying myself first, that was the thing that changed everything for me. Once I said, okay, I need to save this amount of money so that I can invest this amount. And that's going straight out of my account on day one. And I'm not going to wait till the end of the month before I'm saving. I'm saving on, on day one of the month. And then I'm going to find a way to live off the rest. And then you can budget and you work out how you're, you're going to spend your money. But for me, the whole idea of paying yourself first instead of paying everyone else and then whatever's left you get to keep, uh, I, I think that was the biggest thing for me. Um, and, and that's a that's a, just a habit that I've now gotten into. The other thing is, you know, in the US, I know you've got the 401k. I don't know why people don't make more of that and you know, sort of take whatever match their employer employer might be providing. Even here in Thailand, we have a 5% match. Um, Australia has what we call superannuation. So money is taken out of our, our income. Um, when I was in Hong Kong, it was the same thing. And there was an employer match there as well. So not only is that sort of um, has tax benefits, but it's just money that you forget about. It's taken out. And then all of a sudden you realize, well, hang on, there's this money that's there that's working for me it's being invested um but the the key thing for me was just pay yourself first and then budget from there rather than spend 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 and at the i did this all my life at the end of the month how much have i got left okay well i've got this tiny amount of money left um and that's what i would save and it just wasn't doing it for me i i think that's that's fantastic advice it's one of those things that, you know, I, I've been listening to podcasts and reading books and they all said, pay yourself first. And I always had a reason for why I wasn't doing that. And then one day I was like, I really ought to start doing that. You know, and it just, it makes all the difference when you actually follow the advice that, that people uh, recommend because it's good advice. So just, you know, wake up and start doing it. That's all it yeah. takes is just Absolutely. take the action to start paying yourself first uh, and then, budget with what's left over. I think that that's fantastic. Uh, you mentioned, and I didn't quite catch the term that you use, but you, it's like money you pulled out your paycheck in Australia. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, we call it superannuation. Is that um, kind of like a pension where it's going to be money that gets paid back to you at, uh, for the rest of your life after your... your yeah, you, you, get to, you get to collect it or do whatever you want with it after you reach a certain age. So for us at the moment, I think it's 60 is the, um, the, the time when you have access to your, your superannuation. Your, your, we just call it your, your super. And I think they're, they're increasing the amount that employers have to put in or how much they have to take out of your salary. I think it's around about 9.5% now gets, that's, gets invested and they're, they're increasing that even further. And so that's normally invested in, and you get to have a little bit of control over how that is invested. Um, it goes into a, a fund, a, sort of a, a managed fund. Um, and yeah, it's, it's quite controversial. In, during COVID, a lot of politicians were saying, well, that's your money. You should be able to get it, take it out and use it for a deposit on a home. And so a lot of people were able to do that. Um, in times of emergency, you can take that money out. Unfortunately, a lot of people did. They took it out, they spent it, now it's gone. Um, and so when people hit 60, there, there won't be as much there, but I think it's a great thing. It was brought in the, in the 1980s, um, and many people, that's their only form of investment. And it, 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 you know, mine has grown quite a lot. I haven't contributed to it a great deal because when I, I left Australia 20, 20 odd years ago, there was a certain amount in there and I, I can still contribute to it from, from overseas, but it, it's not my primary investment, but it's, it's still sitting there and it's still doubling every seven years like like they say it's meant to um which is great and so i know that i've got that nest egg there for when i when i do retire even though it was only sort of maybe half of my teaching career that um contributions were going into it it's it's still over a long period of time becomes quite a lot um here we have a thing called the the provident fund the Thai provident fund same thing we can opt to, I'm putting in 15% of my salary. So it's uh, it's a big four tax contribution. And my school, pay, uh, they don't match it, but they put in 5%. So it's free money. Why wouldn't you want free money? Yeah, that, that's great. So that, that's more like a, a retirement account than, than a pension. is. so we won't talk about pensions right now then, uh, but just mm -hmm. 
how do, do these retirement benefits, do these contribute to your, your stress-free version of wealth or do, do those not factor in because uh, you're not accessing them right now? Yeah, I think for me, when you're young, it's hard to look that far ahead. And so you just keep thinking, oh, they're taking money out of my pay packet. It's not fair. But as you get closer to retirement, suddenly you're feeling, oh, I'm so glad that's there. So for me, I mean, I, I check the balance occasionally and I see it growing. Um, obviously, it goes up and it goes down because it's, it's invested in stocks. Um, but yeah, I'm 55 now. So I, you know, I, I could think about retiring at 60. Our, our, um, the actual pension that we, we receive, which is a government payment if we, if we need it, uh, which is means tested uh, in Australia, starts at 67. So a lot of people retire in Australia at 67 and they rely partly on a, a government pension, which is not the money that's in your superannuation. That's a, a different thing. I think we use the word pension in a different way. Pension for us is um, a fortnightly payment from the government for anyone who's stopped working. Yeah, so um, for so us, just so you know, we have Social yep. Security, which is the government version, and then yes. schools pay us a pension like that as well. In, in many right. states, it's state-based. So there's like the, the federal, the entire United States has the social security program, which some teachers are and are not a part of. And then yep. in our individual states, we have pension programs for public employees, such as teachers. Sure. So we yep. kind of have both or, or just one and it's really confusing, but yeah. Yeah, so it's a si similar kind of thing. And, and back to your, your question about how does it reduce stress? I think more and more, I, I don't know, I, I'm sure this wasn't always the case, but more and more people are worried about what happens when they retire. They're worried, they're, they're stressed about, will I have enough? We're living longer. Um, governments are getting a little bit um, less inclined to keep up those pensions uh, or those, those social security payments and, and talking about we can't afford it as our population ages. Uh, there's more pressure on on that maybe being taken away some of those benefits. So to have your own savings, your own investments there ready for when you retire is definitely going to be reducing stresses. So I, I feel happy that you know I've got that there, but I, I feel that so many more people are are worried, are, are stressed about what happens when they can't work anymore, and we're seeing an increase in homelessness with regards to um, older people who just run out of money at some point. So. Does that reduce my stress? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, this has been a great conversation. I've, I've enjoyed learning a little bit about international and Australian financial situations as well, but also just talking about how we can uh, set our money aside in certain ways to reduce our stress, whether that's you know for retirement, like we were just talking about, or having you know, your uh, just-in-case fund on the side and you know, having that gap between your, your income and your expenses, all these things make us wealthier. I, I like to say that teachers are rich already. Their wallet just needs to catch up. And um, yeah. I, that applies to, you know, just like the richness of what we're doing as a profession. But if you can build this more stress-free life, that, that means that you're already experiencing the benefits of being rich. If you can make your life stress-free or just incredibly reduce the stress that you are under absolutely so i've got just two more questions for you as we're wrapping up here uh the same questions i ask all my guests my first one is what is your number one tip for teachers to have a richer wallet classroom in life <laughs> um i feel like i've said some of these things already but I, I suppose the thing is you know having those habits in place uh, and being disciplined and sticking with the things that we we know work but I, I think the other thing uh, as a teacher is realizing how lucky we are in our jobs and, and trying to find ways to love our job. I mean, I'm always talking about, you know, quitting my job and doing something different. And then I keep coming back to the fact that I actually love what I do. Uh, so sometimes we've got to work at loving our job and finding ways to love our job and realizing that, I mean, one of the greatest things about freedom, right, is control and very few jobs give you the control that teachers have. I mean, I, I feel I can do whatever I want in my classroom. It's my, it's, it's my workplace. It's my space. It's, it's where I uh, feel comfortable, but it's, um, we have a fair bit of control of how we do things and, and how we interact with, with our students and lots of different ways that we can 
enjoy our job more, I suppose. And sometimes we just forget that. So I, I guess that's my thing is every time I think about not wanting to be a teacher because it gets you down sometimes, I think, well, actually, how can I just make my job better? And, and there are always ways to do that. I love it. That's fantastic. Just focusing on, on the things that you can you can control instead of, you know, the stuff that, that's out of your control because that's really all you can do is, is handle what's in your control, make your life better as a result. That's fantastic. All right. If, if a teacher wants to ask you about your, your work with uh, teenagers and their finances, or they want to know something about uh, teaching internationally, because that's uh, an area of expertise that you have as well, we just want to you know, connect with you, talk to you. How can teachers get in contact with you? Yeah, so they can, they can get hold of me through my, my blog, my website, as, as you found. So it's just called thefinanceteacher.com. Um, but also I've got another, another blog, which is all about international teaching and about sort of my international teaching journey. It's called the footloose teacher. So it's just www.thefootlooseteacher.com. So they're sort of, um, that, that's my, my recent little projects have involved blogging. So I started those a couple of years ago and it's the finance one I've been focusing more on, but, um, I also love to, to talk about international teaching. So, um, yep. Yeah track me down there and um, I'm happy to um, get in touch with people and sort of um, either talk finance or talk international teaching. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for coming on the show. This has been a ton of fun. Uh, if you found this as helpful or you want to find that massive list of books that we went over, uh, you can go to teachermoneyshow.com slash podcast. You'll find the show notes for this show and any other show that we have done there. And uh, if you found the show valuable, please tell a teacher friend about it. I know you've got plenty of teacher friends out there, so go tell them and remember that this information can change their life. It can make their life stress-free and wealthy if they apply these principles. So please share this with a teacher friend. Thank you for listening. Are you worried you won't have enough money to retire? Or maybe you just don't know how you're going to get out of all of this debt. Whatever your situation is, I can help you. Go to teachermoneyshow.com slash guest and fill out the form there and you can come on the show for free coaching or we can meet one-on-one -on -one to discuss your needs. I look forward to talking to you.